Well, today there's not any particular, well, there's a couple of verses that are scheduled for today. But I'm going to spend the whole service, the first half and second half, talking about how important the Feast of Sukkot is, or the Feast of Tabernacles. The first thing I want to give you is the concept. Okay, what was God trying to communicate to us with this festival? Does anybody know? What, was the, what is the main, I mean, there are several main points, but what is one of the main points that he wanted us to realize by this festival? What? His provision. Well, let me show you. Yeah, that, yeah, there's all kinds of main points. But one of the things is, first off, does anyone know when Sukkot is first mentioned in the Bible? Look at your notes. <laughs> Look at Genesis 33:17. Jacob journeyed, now we're talking Jacob, long before Moses, okay? And where did Jacob journey to? Sukkot. And he built a house, and he made what? Who knows what the Hebrew word for booths are? Sukkot. So this could read, he journeyed to Sukkot, built him a house, made Sukkot for his cattle, therefore the name of the place is called what? Sukkot. And so what he did, he made tents. He made a, a, a sukkah. Basically, it's a temporary dwelling place. God made the heavens and the earth as a temporary dwelling place. Our bodies are a temporary dwelling place. Now, uh, one of the things that I always loved to do as a kid, it wasn't like this, but how many of you ever had a tent over your bed and you got in the tent as a kid, you made this tent, and sometimes mom and dad would get in the tent, and you'd have so much fun. Well, that's what God did. He created this universe for us, and this world is a temporary dwelling place. But this world is going to go away, and we're going to end up having a permanent dwelling place with God in the heavens. Now, think about this. Here we go. A cemetery. Guess what? Our bodies are also temporary dwelling places. It's a temporary dwelling place. Okay? That's what it is. Now, get rid of that one. Okay, so here we go. Let's look at Leviticus 23, 33. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say, on the 15th day of this seventh month is the Feast of Booths for how many days? To the Lord. And the booths, what's the Hebrew word for booths? It's a coat. And it's for seven days. And guess what? A day with the Lord is a thousand years. Seven thousand years. And the temporary dwelling place is gone. From creation, God has, is celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles for 7,000 years or seven days. And after the millennial reign comes the new heavens and the new earth. This is why it is seven days long. And creation took how many days? Seven days. So in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth as only temporary dwelling places for man to dwell in. Look at Isaiah 51.6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens are going to what? Vanish away like smoke. And the earth will wax old like a garment. And those that dwell therein will die in like manner. Not only are our bodies temporary dwelling places. The earth and the heavens are only temporary dwelling places. Look at 2 Peter 1.13 and 14. Peter says, yea, I think it necessary as long as I am in this what? Tabernacle. To stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Well, that word there for tabernacle in Greek is skenos, and it means a temporary residence, a hut. Figuratively, and this, it's his body. This tabernacle that I'm in, 
It's got to go. And then I'm going to get a new one that's going to last a lot longer. Yay. <laughs> Look at 2 Corinthians 5.1. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The whole concept of the Feast of Tabernacles, the main thing is everything's temporary. How many of us know that? We've all had uh, family members who've died, pets that died. I, mean, I don't care what it is. Everything is temporary. God created this for us to know we are in a temporary pattern right now, but that which is permanent is coming, and I believe very soon. Now, here we go. Here's the earth and the sun. And guess what happened at the very first Feast of Tabernacles? When was the very first Feast of Tabernacles? In Genesis, at creation, God tabernacled with Adam and Eve. One of the things I want to point out here, horrible uh, Greek thinking by much of the church, they don't understand prophecy. They look at it as a Greek checklist. Oh, done, won't happen again. That's wrong. That's crazy. Here are the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's put a... When you say Feast of Tabernacles is fulfilled, it's fulfilled over and over and over and over and over. For example, here's our timeline. After the Garden of Eden... And everyone's cast out. God still wanted to tabernacle with us. So the Feast of Tabernacles was fulfilled again with Moses' tabernacle. Then it was fulfilled again with Solomon's temple. Okay. And then Ezra and Nehemiah had to rebuild it. And then Herod rebuilt it. And the Jews rebuilt it. Well, guess what? Then the Feast of Tabernacles was fulfilled when Yeshua was born on this day. That's the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Then when... He was about, uh, you know, during his ministry, those three and a half years, it was fulfilled again in John chapter 7 at the Feast of Tabernacles. And guess what? During the Ezekiel temple millennial reign, it'll be fulfilled again. And then after the millennial reign, it'll be fulfilled again with the new heavens and the new earth. And so uh, this is the problem with all millennialists. They think it happened once and never happened again. Wrong. Because it's happened before, it will happen again. It's going to be with a different perspective. Just like if you look at your house on earth and then you look at your house from a plane. Okay, you're going over your house, but it's a different perspective. All the feasts have multiple fulfillments over and over. That's why we need to be on God's calendar. So we want to see, okay, will this year be another fulfillment? I hope that makes sense. So God's ultimate plan has always been to dwell with us or to tabernacle with us. Look at Leviticus 23, 41 through 44. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord how many days? And again, that represents the 7,000 year plan of God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall keep it in the seventh month. And look at this. You shall dwell in booths or in a temporary dwelling place. We think of our house as a permanent dwelling place. And a little tent or a hunt as a temporary dwelling place. So we have to remind ourselves what we think is permanent isn't permanent. And so we have to look at this. You shall, that's a command, shall dwell in booths seven days. All who are native born in Israel shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I'm the one who made the children of Israel to do what? Dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I'm the Lord your God. And Moses declared to the children of Israel, the appointed feasts of the Lord. Well, think about this, where he wants us to realize that Israel was pulled out of Egypt. Egypt represents the world. And so Israel were God's kids, and he pulled them out of the world, out of Egypt, over into the promised land. And three times he says, you shall dwell in booths, dwell in booths, dwell in booths. Maybe we get the idea we should probably, probably what? Well, in both. Okay. Now, there's a lot we can't do because there's no temple, but we can do what we can do. Now, look at Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9. God says to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, the Hebrew is different. You know what it really says? That I may dwell within them. 
Ah, big difference. And then he says, according to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle. This is the feast of what? Tabernacles. Everything's based after the pattern. What does that mean? They keep the Feast of Tabernacles in heaven. Today, in heaven, they're celebrating that Yeshua was born. They're having a party for seven days in heaven. You have to realize what's going on on earth is happening in heaven. But here's what's amazing about Moses' tabernacle and the Feast of Tabernacles, when it was fulfilled. In Genesis... God built a tabernacle for us to dwell in. In Exodus, man reciprocates the story of Genesis, and we build a temporary dwelling place for God. He made a dwelling place for us, and now God asks us to make a tabernacle that he can dwell. This is our tabernacle, and he wants to dwell inside of you. Wow. Now, look at John. 114. And the word was made flesh and what? Tabernacled among us. That's the same word. God tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the whole history of creation begins with the Feast of Tabernacles, a temporary dwelling place. And look how the Bible ends. In Revelation 21, 1 through 4, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was not even any more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven and prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will finally dwell with them. And they shall be his people, God himself will be with them and be their God, and God is going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. But guess what else? He's tabernacling with men, and during the Feast of Tabernacles, you have to rejoice. There can be no whiny whinies. There can be no death, no sorrow, no pain. So it totally fits with the whole theme. Okay, so that's the main thing of the Feast of Tabernacles is looking at the whole concept of everything is temporary. And that's what comforts us at the loss of our friends, our loved ones, our relatives, is guess what? We also have a temporary dwelling place. They just got their permanent one first. So let's look at the commands. What are the commands concerning the Feast of Tabernacles? Leviticus 23, 1 and 2, the Lord told Moses... Say, speak to the children of Israel and say to them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So whose feasts are they? God's. He gave them to Israel, but they're not Israel's feasts, they're God's feasts. Now, I want to go over each one of these words here, but let's start with Leviticus 23, 4. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Okay, so look at the screen. Here we go. I have it in Hebrew. Then I have the transliteration of English letters. And then I have the actual verse in English. These are the feasts I have in a black square. Holy gatherings or holy convocations in yellow. And then the fact that we're to proclaim it, I think that's green, in their seasons, and that is red. But I have to point how bad English is. Here we go. The word feasts, what do you think the Hebrew word for feast is? Okay, so here we go. I did it in black. You see at the beginning, because it goes the other direction, moaday, moaday, that's feast. And you see it up at the very top, going right to left in the black square. Moaday, referring to the appointed times. But now the yellow, we have holy gatherings. And right there, you can see in yellow at the top, a mikra. Uh, in this case, it's mikra A. All right. And that means a holy convocation or a dress rehearsal. These were to be dress rehearsals of what would happen prophetically in the future. And then we have the word proclaim in green. You have tikra u. And there it is on top. It's the two-letter root is kara, which means to proclaim. 
we are supposed to be proclaiming the feast, which is why we have the calendar, which is why we promote all over the world, everyone needs to keep the feast. But now, here's my most amazing one. In red is seasons. Now, you notice they have feasts here, and it's the Moed. What do you think seasons is? There it is. Be Moadim. Okay. Or this would be uh, Be Moadam. I think. And then, but look at it there. The word for feast and the word for seasons is the same Hebrew word. Now, how, when you think of feast, you think of food. When you think of seasons, you think of winter. This is the problem. It's the same Hebrew word as you can see. And so we have to understand that in the English, when it has in the same sentence, two different English words, but it's the same Hebrew word. These are divine appointments. It's a set time. Let me give you an example of how important understanding this. I decided to do it this way. Okay, what happens on April 15th? Tax season, everyone knows that, right? Okay, what if we as a group say, well, we want to tell the IRS we're going to do it in June. <laughs> Can we move it? No. How about the 4th of July? If I said, let's keep the 4th of July and the 3rd of January. How do you celebrate the 4th of July and the 3rd of January? But Nisan 14, which is Passover, Christians can say it can be an ER 25. They move it because they don't follow the biblical calendar. God is the one who set Nisan 14 and 15. So when's Passover? Nisan 14 and 15. God is a greater boss than the IRS. And if you're committed to celebrating the 4th of July on the 4th of July, and if you're committed to paying your taxes by April 15th, you sure better be committed to Nissan 14 as Passover. You can't be changing it. God has a daytimer. It's been forever set in concrete. It's been set from the foundation of the world. It has. I believe Abraham honored Passover. It was different than as it grew and the different things that happened, but all the feasts were celebrated, which is why I wrote the book on God's daytimer, uh, talking about how God already has a set calendar and Christianity cannot change it. How many of you have ever been to a play? Okay, these are like, but at, before the play, what happens? There's a whole lot of energy in the dress rehearsal. They got to do all these dress rehearsals, just like our worship team here does rehearsals before they come and sing, just like the astronauts. I would hope they would do rehearsals before they took off to the moon, okay? When it says they're holy convocations, that means the feasts were dress rehearsals for what was going to come. So unbeknownst to Israel, every year they practice killing the Passover lamb on Nisan 14 because that's when he's going to die. And if we end up changing the biblical calendar, we're not going to know when prophecy is fulfilled. How many of you got married once in your life? Okay. Well, guess what? When you got married, I hope you and your spouse agreed on the day <laughs> and on the time or it ain't going to happen. Okay. Well, if you want to be at the marriage supper of the lamb or the wedding of the Messiah, you got to go when he decides, not when you decide. These are all divine appointments. But here's what's amazing. When it says to proclaim it, it means to those who were already to be involved. It's a personal invitation. God invited you to come to the wedding of his son. And can you believe it? And look at this. He even brought his lulav and etrog. This is a divine appointment that God determined. I mean, you know, sometimes when you go someplace and someone says, uh, you know, what's the deal? Well, I'm with him or I'm with her, right? Okay, if they ask me, do I go, well, God's with me. I'm not with, I'm with God, but he's the one that's leading the way, not me. You know, they'll saying, God is my co-pilot. I feel sorry for you. He better be your pilot. Okay, so what do we have here? 
Leviticus 23, 4. Look how they translate the very same verse I just read. That's the Jewish Publication Society. It says, these are the appointed seasons of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their appointed season. But again, that has to go with the Moedim. Now, speaking of weddings. Oh, my gosh. Speaking of running late. Okay, we're going to have to hurry. Okay, look at Zephaniah 1.7. This is where all of these... Uh, mentions in the gospel refer back to this. Zephaniah 1.7 says, Hold your peace at the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord's at hand. That refers to the tribulation. Hold your peace. It says, The Lord prepared a sacrifice, and what did he do? He bid his guests. God has sent personal invitations for everyone to come. Well, look at Matthew 22, 1 through 3. Jesus answered, spoke a parable, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, sent forth the servants to call those that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Can you imagine? There is a wedding that is coming. Wedding bells are ringing, and some people do not want to come to the wedding, even after a personal invitation. Okay, so here we have the wedding. Here's the thing, a Jewish wedding lasts seven days, okay, which is like the seven-year tribulation. And if you don't want to come to the wedding, well, guess what? You might get a boot in the pants and get to go through the tribulation. And then, how about the wedding supper? Do you want to come to that now? Okay, guess what? If you don't want to be at the wedding, then you can go through the tribulation. And you can be invited to the wedding supper if you'll take that invitation. Look at this, Matthew 22. It goes on, 11, 14, 11 through 14. When the king came to see the guests, he saw a man which didn't have on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how come you came in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said, bind him head and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. This is referring to the tribulation. Whether there's weeping of gnashing and teeth, many are called, but few are chosen. We have to have the white, right wedding garments on. Where does that come from? Zephaniah 1, 8. It'll come to pass in the day of that Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the princes, I will punish the king's own children, and all sisters are clothed with strange apparel. What that is, is trying to come to the wedding in your own righteousness, your own fancy wedding garment, rather than coming in the garment prepared by the king. Now, Revelation 19, 9, if you didn't go to the wedding, well, blessed are those which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true things of God. So there are going to be believers who go through the tribulation, okay? But they are going to be called to the marriage supper. Look at Luke 12, 35 through 37. Let your loins be girded, your lights burning, and yourselves like men that wait for the Lord when he returns from the wedding. So you weren't at the wedding, but now he's going to return from the wedding. And this time when he comes and knocks, open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, will find watching this time. And he says, he'll gird himself, make them to sit down to eat, and he will come forth and serve them. Now, next, what do we see? Oh, whoop, let me go back. I got to go here. So what do we find? The commandment in Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 15 is you shall rejoice for seven days. And the last line says you will surely rejoice. So here, for the next couple of days, Everyone has to rejoice with their lulavs and in the sukkah. And we have a sukkah downstairs. Even at the break that's about to happen, you can get your snacks and go sit in under the sukkah. We built a sukkah out there. And so uh, Exodus 34, 29 is uh, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai. That is on Yom Kippur. And then Exodus 35, 10, five days later is Sukkot. And that's when they begin to build the tabernacle. On the Feast of Tabernacles is when they begin to build the tabernacle. What a concept. And so Exodus 35, 20 through 22, it says that they gathered everything to build the tabernacle. Lo and behold, it was on the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Numbers 29, 12, and 13, it's on the 15th day of the seventh month. You're to have a holy convocation, keep a feast for seven days. And then it says, on the first day, you are to sacrifice how many bulls? Okay, so here we go. Here's your 13 bulls right there. Oh, that's 12. There's the 13th. <clears throat> okay, so why were they supposed to kill 13 bulls 
the first day, the second day, 12, the next day, 11, the next day, 10, the next day, 9, the next day, 8, the next day, 7. What is that total? That totals exactly 70 bulls. And why did they sacrifice 70 bulls over the feast of Sukkot? The 70 nations of the world. So here's the deal. On Yom Kippur, Israel as priests had to make atonement for themselves so that five days later they could make atonement for the nations. That's the other important day. Yom Kippur is only for Israel. Sukkot is for the nations. And then Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 17, again, the Feast of Tabernacles is seven days. Everyone has to rejoice, even the kids, even the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, because, now look at this, right in the middle, because the Lord your God shall bless you. Do you see that? And it says, in all your increase and in all the works of your hands, therefore you shall surely rejoice. Now, why is it you're supposed to rejoice? Because you've been blessed by God. Now, look at this. At the bottom, it says, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they better not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he gives you. Why is that? If you don't give, you're telling God, you never bless me. You've never blessed me, God. And so God says, okay, fine. Bless according as you're able. And... If you don't bring anything on the Feast of Tabernacles, you're really saying, God, he was worthless toward you. That's what you're declaring. So he says, I want you to bless according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has already given you. Not to what he will give you, but what he's already given you. Now, look at Zechariah 14, 14 through 19. If you remember, they were to keep the Feast of Booths three times in those verses. Keep the Feast of Booths. Keep the Feast of Booths. Keep the Feast of Booths. Well, look at Zechariah 14 when the Lord returns. Three times. He says in the middle, it says, All the nations which came against Jerusalem have to go up year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it'll be whoever doesn't come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, they'll get no rain. And if the family of Egypt doesn't come up, they also get the plague. If they don't come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, it's a repeat of the first verse back in Deuteronomy. And then we see in Zechariah 14, 3 and 4, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Okay. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? You need to go to Israel before that happens. Okay, with that said, let's stand. Okay, now we're, just so you know, we're going to do something slightly different. Right after the break, before we do worship, I want everyone to be back here right after the break before worship because we're going to uh, say the prayers, the blessings, and all of you that have lulavs, we're going to come up and wave the lulavs, uh, and it's best if you put them together first. You've got them in bags, but we have scissors downstairs. You want to cut your bags, put everything together so that when we come back during the break, if you get it all put together, you can wave them. You don't want to have a plastic bag waving a plastic bag. All right. But that'll be right uh, after the break. We'll call everybody back. We want everyone here for the waving of the lulavs and the blessings. <sighs> Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for this most wonderful, wonderful uh, blessing of reminding us that we're only here temporarily. Not only that, this planet's only here temporarily. The heavens are only here temporarily. But Father, we want to bless you according to the blessing that you have blessed us. We want you to know we've been blessed by you. Absolutely. We are so grateful for all the blessings you bestowed upon us. Even if we're the widow and only have a widow's might, that doesn't matter because it's all about according to the blessing that we bless you. And Father, we just thank you that we can all be a light to your nations and bring your lost kids back to you. So I just pray that you bless again and continue to bless all those who participate in taking the light of your Torah to the nations 
forever and ever. That's what we want to do. It's all about you and it's all about the light of your Torah. So thank you for those live streamers and for those locally who just want to bless you according to the blessing how you blessed us. We thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Enjoy the sukkah and get your lulavs ready. All right. Are you ready? Everybody buckled in. Can you imagine there's so much to talk about when it comes to one day? Actually, it's a whole week. So we're going to start with Leviticus 23. All about the feast is in Leviticus 23 and Numbers 29. That's where it talks about them. But Leviticus 23, verse 39 and 40, it says, Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, which is today, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you have to keep a feast to the Lord seven days. On the first day is to be a Sabbath. So even if this day fell on a Wednesday, Wednesday becomes a Sabbath. All right? But it so happens we have a double Sabbath today. But then it says on the eighth day. What do you mean the eighth day? It's only kept for seven days. The eighth day is known as Shemini Atzeret, which I'm going to talk about next Shabbat. Uh, and it is very, very significant. Uh, and so we'll be talking about that. But then it goes back to today. It says on the first day of the week, you're to take bows of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, bows of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And again, you have to rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Can you imagine how hard it is for people not to whine? <laughs> for seven whole days. No whiny whinies. Now, let me explain the symbolism of all of the different branches. I'm going to explain that. I'll put this right here. Okay. The etrog, which looks like a big lemon, uh, it talks about Messiah's beauty, and he is the branch bearing fruit. This kind of like the fruit of the Messiah. The lulav here uh, represents his righteousness and his power to save from Psalms 92:12. Uh, the myrtle represents praise and rejoicing, and the willow represents Messiah's humility and the suffering servant. So that's kind of what you're worshiping him with. Okay, so let's look at Isaiah. I have here a picture of the Mount of Olives. How many of you have been to the Mount of Olives? Who wants to go see the Mount of Olives? All right, all right. You're going to want to go. Look at Isaiah 2, 1 through 5. Here's the word that Isaiah saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It says, it'll come to pass when? In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains. It'll be exalted above all hills. And then it says, all nations will flow to it. That's what Zechariah 14 is about. It says, many people will go and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Huh, isn't that interesting? And he will teach us. Literally, he will be here and he's going to teach us and we will walk in his paths because out of Zion shall go forth what? Oh my gosh, how can it be done away with if when the millennial reign begins and he's here, that's what he teaches? How many of you believe God is bipolar? Okay, uh, or a schizophrenic. Okay, if the law was good back then, and it's good in the future, why wouldn't it be good now? All right? Okay, and then it says, the word of the Lord is going to go from Jerusalem. He's going to judge among the nations, 
And he's going to rebuke many people, and they will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears to pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. They won't even learn war anymore. So there goes all of the war merchants. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Well, guess what? It's in the mouth of one or, or two or three witnesses. Look at Micah, chapter 4, 1 and 2. In the last days, it'll come to pass. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established in the top of the mountains, exalted above the hills. People will flow. Many nations will come and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his path, for the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay, so that's what's coming to a planet near you. Now, here is kind of a, what Solomon's temple looked like. And we see in 1 Kings 8, 2, that all the men of Israel assembled themselves to King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Back then it was known as Ethanim, but now it's known as Tishri. But this is when all of Israel assembled again when Solomon's temple was about to be consecrated, anointed, established. But look at this in 2 Chronicles 5, 12 through 14. There were 120 priests who were trumpeters. Let's bring in the trumpets. Dun, dun, dun. And the cymbals and the music and everybody singing. It's a big party and it's on the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says here, the singers made themselves heard in what? They were one in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. <clears throat> the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. The priest couldn't even stand a minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Can you imagine? And do you know why it fell that day? They were in one accord. Why did it fall in the book of Acts at Shavuot? They were in one accord. Why did it fall at Passover when Aaron and Moses were consecrating the tabernacle? It says because they were all in one accord. The glory falls at Passover, at Pentecost, at uh, tabernacles when everyone is in one accord. Now, get a load of this. Look at 2 Peter 1.16. It says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Wow. Where did, this is the Mount of Transfiguration, Right? That's when he saw. So when he saw Moses and Elijah and they saw Yeshua there, does anybody know what day that was? It was Sukkot. And I'm going to prove it to you. But look at this. So they were eyewitnesses of the coming of the Messiah. Isn't that what it just says? We may known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, okay? They were eyewitnesses of the second coming. Well, take a look at this little map here. Okay, some people think the transfiguration happened in Mount Tabor, most of the Catholics and most of the Christians. Others believe it was at Mount Hermon, all right? So I'm going to tell you where it was. How do I know? Because I read the Bible. Okay, look at the next verse. In Mark 8, 22, it says he came to Bethsaida. Okay, where he was, he was at Magdala, that vicinity, and then he went over to Bethsaida. Now, do you see where Mount Tabor is? Let's follow his footsteps. He goes from Magdala to Bethsaida. Now look at Mark 8, 27. And Jesus went forth. We're in the same chapter. This is like five verses later. He went forth and his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Wow, look where that is. Huh, well, I wonder what mountain's close to that. Okay. Now, here's the thing. 
Here is where I live. Everyone local knows this. Boom, see Mount Rainier? And down there is the Puyallup Valley at sea level. And I'm up on this hill. Do you see the hill? That's Bondi Lake. I live up there. So that is called a hill. These are called mountains. This is called a high mountain. Okay. Bonnie Lake, our east hill, is 608 feet. Mount Tabor is 636 feet. Mount Tabor is the same height as the east hill here. Okay. I don't know why they call it Mount. It should be Hill Tabor. Okay. 636 feet. That is a hill. Mount Hermon, 9,232 feet. That is called a high mountain. It's not as high as Mount Rainier, but it's a pretty high mountain. But when you look at the directions they were traveling, right next to it was Mount Hermon. Now, look at Mark 9, 1, 20, 1 2, and 5. He now says to them, Verily, I, I'm telling you that there will be some of them that are standing here which will not taste of death till they have seen what? The kingdom of God come with power. And then it says, after six days, isn't that interesting? Six days, 6,000 years, and then the Messiah comes at the beginning of the seventh day or the 7,000th year, he will return. Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up to a what? High mountain. Doesn't say a hill. By themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And what did they sing? The coming of the Messiah with power, right? And so what does Peter say? He says, Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. And let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Why? Because he saw him coming during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why he said to build the sukkahs. Should we build them? It's tabernacles. Wow, what a concept. Now, again... Six days, 6,000 years. And we see that, again, it's all in the feast of the seventh month. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, all these things are going to be happening. Now, here's the temple during Jesus' day. All right? <clears throat> the celebrations that, had, that they were having in the temple... Josephus, who lived then, said there were two million people in Jerusalem for the feast because they came from every nation. I mean, they're coming from Africa and Iraq and Iran. They had to be there three times a year. So they are there and they came to party. All right. It says that the pilgrims who arrived in Jerusalem... They came to the temple's courtyard and they came to rejoice because that's what they had to do. The focus of this rejoicing was the ceremony surrounding the commandment to pour water on the altar known as the water libation. Why are they pouring water? They're a desert. They need water. As a matter of fact, the latitude is the same as Scottsdale, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. If you were to draw a line, that's where they're at. Okay. Now, every year at this time, their whole focus is on praying for the living water to come down. They need the rain for the crops. So here they are for seven days praying for living water to descend. And Yeshua is the fountain of living waters. <clears throat> the sages in Israel testified to the celebrations of the water libations from the days of the second temple, and they described the great joy that was taking place. Now, uh, they go on to say, whoever has not seen the celebration of the water libation has never experienced the feeling of true joy. Now, here is the women's court. This was the women's court. Those steps, okay, lead to the Nicanor Gate, and there would be priests, 120 priests, on those steps singing the Psalms, the Hallel. So that's what they're doing. And there were, in the women's court now, all of these people lining, watching the uh, priests dance and rejoice. These are the uh, balcony where the women's were in the women's court. And you see those giant candlesticks with those four big lights. All right. 
there would be these young priests, and it'd have to be young. You know how tall those were? 75 feet, seven and a half stories tall. And these priests, young priests, would climb them with a ladder, and they'd be loaded with oil, and that's how they kept the flames going. They would pour the oil in it, and what was used for the wicks were the stained priestly garments that were no longer used because they're covered with blood and they never washed them, all right? So they'd get stained. All the priestly garments that were stained with the sacrifices were cut into strips and they were stored in baskets in the women's court. That's what the priests used for wicks and the women would take those uh, strips home and they would use them for other purposes at home. But this party would go 24-7, even on the Sabbath, okay? They'd be rejoicing. Every night, there'd be priests, and they're juggling torches. Can you imagine? I mean, it was just complete party time. And there would be these two priests up on those steps that I was showing you, and they're blowing trumpets. Everyone's uh, blowing uh, trumpets. And they say that once light lit... There was not a courtyard in all of Jerusalem that didn't glow with the light that emanated from the celebration in the temple courtyard. And in John chapter 8, if you remember, John chapter 7 is all about the Feast of Tabernacles. And in John 8, verse 12, this is when Yeshua spoke to them, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me won't walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And this is during the festival with all these lights and they didn't have electricity back then okay have you ever seen a map of the world at night and you see where the lights are you know where the people live you see where it's pitch black well back then the whole world was pitch black except for jerusalem it was lit up and yeshua says i am the light of the world now i'll tell you something else that's kind of interesting what did i say they used as wicks they cut the priestly garments into strips after they've been stained with the sacrifices for our sins and everything. Well, guess what? Those strips were the swaddling clothes Yeshua was wrapped in as a baby. That was the swaddling clothes. He was wrapped in the garments of our sin that had been stained from the sacrifices. Okay. Now, uh, let me just, yeah, the Levites would be standing on those 15 steps that ascend from the women's court to the court of Israel, and they were all playing on all kinds of instruments. Uh, the two priests I showed you would be blowing silver trumpets. They stood at the top of the stairs, and all of this, again, was to honor the commandment of the water libation. Okay, they had the special elevated balconies. Let me bring back the special elevated balconies. There they are. Uh, they were constructed to enable the women of Israel to watch all the men of the Sanhedrin as they danced. Okay, now, like I said, two million people. The place was packed. And so here's what happened. You, because they're commanded to be there, the, there's two million people, Jew, Jews, from all over the world. And so the 24 courses of priests that had been divided into three groups of eight all of them had to come and serve that week because they're sacrificing all these 70 bulls plus 2 million people bringing sacrifices that you have to sacrifice and all this kind of stuff. So one group, that's all they're doing. They're the, oh, oh I can't think of it, the butcher shop or whatever. I mean, that's all they're doing for a whole week. Another group of, there were two other groups of priests and they had all different responsibilities. One of them was responsible for the water libation ceremony, which was head, headed up by the high priest. When you know Jerusalem, they have a southern gate, all right? And the southern gate leads down to, through the city of David, down to the pool of Siloam, because the pool of Siloam had living water, all right? Imagine again. There are two million people, there's hundreds of thousands of priests, and they're all participating. And so uh, the daily ceremony 
which was headed by, the second group headed by the high priest, went out the water gate down to the pool of Siloam. So they're leaving, they're announcing it, and here they go down to the pool of Siloam. And he had a golden vase. At dawn, the assembly proceeded singing to the uh, spring of Siloam, and there the high priest had a golden vase, and he would draw the living water, and next to him was another priest with a decanter that was silver. So you've got a golden vase and a silver vase. Again, the gold represents kingship, the silver represents redemption, and the silver vase had wine in it. So you have the blood and the water. And what they would do, they would then, and again, there's tens of thousands of people following them down in the morning, following them back up into the temple. And when they got inside the temple, they would proceed to, uh, oops, went the wrong way. They'd proceed to the altar and they would take the golden vessel filled with living water and pour it in a vessel in the corner. And then the other priest would pour uh, his, uh, the wine, uh, into uh, the other vessel. And what they would do also, they would do a march around the altar, okay, one time. And then the next day, they would do all this over again, and they'd march around the altar one time. And how many times do they, how many days is this long? And on the seventh day, they'd do a Jericho march around the altar. They would march around it seven times, and they're praying for, like, the walls to fall down at Jericho. They're praying for the rain to come down. They want the heavens open. They want the living water coming down. Now, it's the coat. Here's what it looks like in Jerusalem. Do you see all the sukkahs? They were everywhere. The sukkahs were flat out everywhere. And now, again, this is more today. You go to Jerusalem at night, it's going to be lit up with sukkahs everywhere, all over the place. All right? As a matter of fact, on Sukkot, think of it this way. Here is the Mount of Olives covered with sukkahs during Jesus' time. All right? Everyone is partying. Everyone is celebrating. Here you have all these people with the lulavs everywhere. Can you imagine two million people all around Jerusalem with these little huts? Okay, guess what they do? They sing, and guess what they sing? The Hallel Psalms, all right, 113 through 118. So Psalms 118 is always sung, and look at your notes in verse 14. They're singing, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my Yeshua. Wow. And then look at verse 15. What are you commanded to do during tabernacles? Rejoice. And what does it say? The voice of rejoicing and Yeshua is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord is doing valiantly. Okay, so why do they sing, he has become my salvation? The Lord is my strength and my song? Because, look at Exodus 15, verse 2. This is where that began. They're across the Red Sea, and Miriam bursts out in song. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation, or Yeshua. This is my God. I will praise him. My Father's God, I will exalt him. Do you know that phrase is the only phrase in the entire Tanakh that is in the Torah, the prophets, and the writings? We just saw it in the writings in Psalms. We just saw it in the Torah in Exodus. And you're also going to find it in the prophets in Isaiah. But let's go to John chapter 7 for a minute. Now the Jewish festival, the feast of what? Sukkot was at hand. But when it was now in the midst of the feast, Yeshua goes up into the temple and he teaches. And the Judeans were marveling, saying, how does this man know letters having never been edumacated? Little did they know. Okay. Now, do you remember in the story, they were all singing the songs, right? And look at what they were singing. Isaiah 12, 2 through 5. It's only six verses. They're singing, Behold, God is my 
salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid for the Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my Yeshua. And then guess what happens? Right in the middle with millions of people all around and in the temple, everyone singing that song. That is when Yeshua jumps in and interrupts the whole song service. And he says, yes, as the scripture says, whoever comes to me out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Well, where did that come from? That comes from Isaiah 12. It says, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, Declare his doings among the people. Proclaim his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord. For he's done excellent things. Let this be known in all the earth. So when they get to that verse, he jumps in and interrupts. And he goes, yes, John 7, 37 and 38. Now, on that last the great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and what did he do? He cries out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes on me, as the scripture said, from within will flow rivers of living water. They just got done singing that. And then all of a sudden, he jumps right into the middle of all the crowd. And he yells out, yes, as the verse said that you just sang, I'm the fountain of living water. Well, guess what? They're all mad at him for interrupting the song service but they have to finish the song. And how does Isaiah 12 end? Cry aloud and shout out, you inhabitant of Zion, for the Holy One of Israel is great and he's standing in your midst. Here he interrupts the song service saying, I'm the fountain of living waters and then they have to sing, the Holy One of Israel standing in your midst. This is incredible. And look at Zechariah 14, 8 and 9. That'll happen in that day. That living waters will go out from Jerusalem, half toward the eastern sea, half toward the western sea, in summer and in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And that day the Lord will be one and his name one. Echad. Okay. So every year on the Feast of Tabernacles, when all the nations come, they're going to have to sing happy birthday <laughs> to Yeshua. So he was born on the Feast of Tabernacles and rejoicing was in the Tabernacle of the Righteous. It was fulfilled. And then at the end of his ministry, again, he fulfills it when he stands up and says, yes, I am the Messiah. Okay, now the third group, well, let me show you these willows. They gather these, uh, I mean, palm branches. They, they gather, they have palm branches, willow branches, everything they're gathering. And that's what they would use to cover their sukkahs. But they also would carry them into the temple and they would stand them up and they'd form a sukkah over the altar. Okay. Now that third group, okay, here the first group is slaughtering all the animals. The second group is going with the high priest down to the pool of Siloam to bring up the living water and the blood with the wine. The third group is going out the eastern gate. And what they're doing, they're going down to what is known as the Moza Valley. And they're pulling the willow branches down. The willow branches were about 20 feet long. Okay, not three feet, 20 feet long, these willow branches. And there'd be tens of thousands of priests all holding these willow branches and they would take a step and wave the willow branch and take a step and wave the willow branch doing this all the way as they rise up to the eastern gate now what happens when you think of the can you imagine hearing the wind of a thousands of willow branches being waved well guess what the hebrew word for wind is ruach the same one for the spirit so on the southern gate, the living water and the blood is coming up through the water, the living water gate. And on the eastern side, the spirit of God is coming into the temple from the eastern side. Now, and they did this simultaneously, okay? As each party reached their gates, there would be a priest standing on top of the corner of the temple of the eastern and the southern side. And when they get to the gate, they all have to stop. And the priest would play a flute. Well, because a flute is pierced, he was known as the pierced one calling for the wind and the water to enter into the temple. That's Messiah. 
the pierced one calling for the ruach, the spirit, and the living water coming into the temple. Okay, now, are you ready for some dates? Let me show you something. Here we go. Messiah was born in the fall of 4 BC on the 15th of the coat, tabernacles. That's when he was born. And all nations will come to him on his birthday to acknowledge him as king of the world. And that's at the full moon. And there will be a birthday party like no other every year for a thousand years. Now, he was born in the biblical year of 3757. Okay? 3757, which was 4 BC. He began his ministry at almost 30 years old in the fall of 3786 in the biblical year, which was 26 AD or CE. And he dies in the spring of 3790 or 30 CE. So that just gives you an idea of when that happened. But again, all the nations have to come up at this time. Now look at Luke 2, 7, 6 and 7. It says, and so it was, that while they were there, uh, it says the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in what kind of clothes? That's the priestly garments. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Why was there no room in the inn? It was the Feast of Tabernacles. There's two million people there. The hotels were already booked. Okay, so here we are. They're all having little sukkahs everywhere. There's your manger. manger. But guess what? He was born in a sukkah during the Feast of Sukkot. And as I said, Exodus 15, 2, the Lord is my strength and my song. It's become my salvation. Psalm 118, 4, the Lord is my strength and my song. It's become my salvation. And then as I said, not only when he was an adult, but as a baby, cry and shout, you inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. That literally was happened on Sukkot. They're singing that when he was born. And the reason there's no room in the inn was because of all the people. So he was born on the feast of Sukkot. All right, that's where he was. Now, there are some people that uh, think he was born at Christmas. Well, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Israel in the winter, but it snows. Okay. Now, how many of you have ever heard of snowbirds? Who, what are snowbirds? Okay. I mean, how many of you know that God is a very nice dad? He really is. Do you think... He's going to have Mary try to go to Jerusalem in the middle of winter by herself, you know. But on Sukkot, everybody travels together in massive groups for protection. They're all there. She's probably in a wagon, a covered wagon, whatever. I would not want to ride a camel for 40 miles, nine months pregnant, okay? But like snowbirds, it says there's no room in the inn. Is everyone going to go to Alaska in the middle of winter? No. Where do they go? Arizona. And who wants to be in Arizona in the middle of summer? Nobody. They want to be snowbirds to Alaska. You following me? So when they believe he was born at Christmas, that's absolutely absurd. Okay? Uh, there wouldn't be any room in the, there would be all kinds of room in the inn if he went there in winter. But during a feast, when everyone's commanded to be there, that's when there would be no room in the inn. Now, other people think he wasn't born at Christmas, but he was born at Passover. That's almost the dumbest thing I've ever heard as well. And I, I tell you why. Because, first off, how long was his ministry? Three and a half years. If he was born at Passover, and the Bible says he started his ministry at his birthday... It says he was just at 30 years old. If he ministered three and a half years, that would put him dying in Sukkot, not at Passover. But if he was born at Sukkot and he ministers three and a half years, that puts him dying at Passover. Okay, but aside from that, we're going to wrap this up here. Look at, let me see where I am. Okay, uh, Luke 2, 20 and 22. The shepherds return, and again, shepherds aren't out in the fields in the middle of winter in Israel. 
They glorified and praised God for all the things they had heard and seen. And it was told to them when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yeshua, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Do you realize what that means? If he was born on the first of Sukkot, he circumcised on the eighth day, Shemini Atzeret, shedding his blood, confirming the covenant to Abraham on the circumcision of the child. And so then... Uh, it also talks about uh, them coming after the 30 days and they see Yeshua and they all know that this is the guy. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up with this, which is mind blowing. Are you ready? You're going to either want to take pictures of this or make good notes. Let me get a drink and I'll wrap this up. Okay, we're going to start with Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Who is this referring to? Yeshua. His name is called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he's going to be sitting upon what? The throne of David, which means he's going to be Jewish. Okay. From the tribe of Judah, the throne of David. Upon his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts is the one who's going to perform this. So we know this child will be from the line of David. Okay, let's go to Matthew 1, 20 and 23. Take notice, however, after he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him by way of a dream, saying, Yosef, son of David, don't be afraid to take Miriam. Who's Miriam? Mary, okay, don't be afraid to take Miriam as your wife because the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit and she will give birth to a son. You shall call his name Yeshua because he will save his people from their sins. And all this happened to fulfill what was foretold by the Lord through the prophet. Take notice of this. The virgin shall become pregnant and shall give birth to a son and they will call his name Emmanuel, which interpreted means God is with us. Okay, I'm going to show you where that comes from. But first, I'm going to bring up a page. Look at Genesis 24, verse 16. Tell me who this is. There is this guy named Eliezer, and he's trying to find a wife for Isaac. And he says, behold, I'm going to stand by the well of water. And it'll come to pass that when the virgin comes forth to draw water, and I say to her, give me, I pray thee, a little water of your pitcher to drink. Okay, well, guess what? Here we go. It says now, right there in verse 43, a virgin comes forth to draw water. Well, what do we know? The Hebrew word for virgin there is... Up at the top, it says Betula. Do you see that? Betula. And you can see it in the Hebrew. B-T-O-L-H. Virgin. That's Betula. That is the word for virgin. A Betula is always basically a virgin. But now look. Verse 43 was, uh, let's read Genesis 24, 16. The damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had she known any man, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. Okay? Now, and then the next one, it says, Behold, I stand by the well of water. It'll come to pass uh, that when the virgin comes forth to draw water and say, and I say to her, give her, I pray thee a little water of your pitcher to drink. Who is this talking about? But first, That word for virgin isn't Betula. It's Alma. Okay, so they're talking about the same lady. One of them calls her a virgin, which is the word Betula. But that same girl here, when it says virgin, it's Alma. So what's the difference between the two? Well, basically, every young girl is a virgin. Okay, but not every virgin is a young girl. They could be older. Okay, and who is this person that they're talking about? Rebecca. Now, this is the first, and I have Rebecca in green and blue because she's called both a Betula and an Alma. 
So Rebecca is a young girl, but she's also a virgin. Now, I want to talk about the word Alma, okay? It means a young child. As a matter of fact, in Exodus 2, 8, Pharaoh's daughter says to uh, Moses' older sister, go, and the girl went and got the child's mother. Okay, so what do you think the Hebrew word for girl is here? It, it could be either one. But in the Bible, it's Alma. This is the second time that the word Alma is used. Okay? Now, it's interesting, uh, and at least, again, English isn't always the best language. But here you have virgin called a batula, which definitely means virgin. And then virgin meaning Alma, which means a young girl. But it also would imply she's a virgin. Are you following me? That's kind of the technical differences here. Okay, and who was that young girl? Miriam. Okay, so the first time Alma is used, it speaks of a virgin in Genesis 24, 43. The second time Alma is used, it's speaking about Miriam. Here we go. So Genesis 24, 43, Alma is virgin. Exodus 2, 8, we see this young girl is named Miriam the second time it's used. But look at this, Isaiah 7, 14 that we just read. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the third time Alma is used. And look at this. So this is why the Jews argue that it doesn't say Betula. They say it only says virgin. Oh, it's, it's Alma. Well, Alma can mean virgin, but it means young girl. But I can show you verses where Alma specifically refers to a virgin because I just showed you Rebecca was called an Alma, but we knew she was a virgin. You following me? Okay, so what do we find here? The first three times the Hebrew word Alma is used, we find... There is a virgin named Miriam who will bear a son and call his name God with us. And he will sit upon the throne of David. The first three times Alma is used, we see a virgin named Miriam will bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Isn't that fascinating? We'll close with that. Let's stand. We're going to pray and then we're going to eat. Have a beautiful week of Sukkot. Remember, we're closed Monday and Friday. Avino Mulcano, our Father King, we just thank you so much that you love us so much that you not only want to bless us, you want to put your name on us amazing that you want to call us your kids and you claim us <laughs> father we just thank you so much and just as you told moses to tell aaron to say the lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that wonderful name, Eye Asher, Eye. Amen. We'll see you next Shabbat on Shemini Atzeret.